Today we're going to look at two pretty interesting problems, starting with what would be a nice homework exercise in an elementary number theory class. So our goal is to determine all primes p so that p minus 1 factorial plus 1 is a power of p. In other words, it equals p to the n for some n bigger than or equal to 1. Okay, so I think probably the first thing to do would be to test a couple of small values of p because often whenever you see these types of problems, there are either no solutions or there are a couple of small solutions and then nothing after a point. It would be extremely weird if the only solution to something like this occurred at a, you know, three digit prime or something. And what we'll see here is we get a couple of small solutions and then nothing after a point. Okay, so the case when p is equal to two, so we have two minus one factorial plus one, that's pretty clearly equal to two, which is two to the first power. Now, what about the case when p is equal to three? Do we have a solution there? Well, here we have three minus one factorial plus three, sorry, plus one. So that's gonna be two factorial, which is two, plus one is three, again, that's three to the first power. Now let's move on to p equals five and see if we still get a solution. So we have five minus one factorial plus one is equal to, well, five minus one is four, factorial is 24, plus one is 25, so we're still good to go here. This is five squared. But as we'll quickly see, in the case when p is equal to seven, we do not get a solution. So let's see, here we'll have seven minus one factorial plus one. Seven minus one is six, factorial is 720, plus one is 721. But let's see, the third power of seven is like 343. The fourth power of seven, well, that's gonna be in the 2000s. Well, that skips right by 721. So that means this does not equal to seven to the n for all natural numbers n. In other words, we have no solution here. And in fact, you can test some more cases, and what you'll see is that these first three solutions seem to be the only solutions. So now let's see if we can prove that. So let's maybe start by supposing that we have a prime p, which is bigger than or equal to seven. And let's maybe rewrite this equation. And so I'll just say such that we have p to the n minus one is equal to p minus one factorial. But now let's observe that gives us p to the n minus one over p minus one is equal to p minus two factorial. Okay, but now let's observe that p minus one is a composite number that's bigger than or equal to six. Maybe let's point that out here. So p minus one is, well, I guess not only is it composite, but it's even, but let's use the fact that it's composite. So it's composite and it's bigger than or equal to six. But well, what does that mean? Well, the fact that it's bigger than or equal to six means that it has two factors that are less than or equal to p minus two. So let's see, it has two factors. I guess I should say a factor pair with both terms less than or equal to p minus uh, two. Since we've got this factor pair, both of whose parts are less than or equal to p minus two, that means that this number right here, p minus two factorial, as we multiply it all up, we will achieve the product of that factor pair, meaning that this object right here is a multiple of p minus one. Okay, great. So now, like I said, we're gonna reduce modulo p minus one and see what happens here. And so while we do it, I'm gonna go ahead and maybe do a cancellation of this stuff on the left-hand side, like a factorization or maybe a standard division here. So here we're gonna have p to the n minus one plus p to the n minus two 
plus all the way down plus p plus one is congruent to zero modulo p minus one. Okay, good. And maybe I'd like to be really careful that this thing right here, this p minus two factorial is a multiple of p minus one because not only is p minus one composite, but it's like kind of big enough. Okay, but now we can reduce the left-hand side of this further. Notice if we're reducing mod p minus one, p is congruent to one mod p minus one. So that gives us one plus one plus one, well, how many times? N times. So we have N is congruent to zero modulo p minus one. But let's observe that N is bigger than or equal to one from this over here. So that means that n is a non-zero multiple of p minus one. In other words, n is gotta be bigger than or equal to p minus one. It's either p minus one, two times p minus one, three times p minus one, so on and so forth. And we'll see that this, this fact that we have just shown that n is bigger than or equal to p minus one is actually the biggest issue that we'll come up with, or that'll lead us to a contradiction. Okay, so now let's maybe dive into the final calculation here. So now let's observe here we have p minus one factorial plus one is equal to p to the n, but observe p to the n is bigger than or equal to p to the p minus one, but then p to the p minus one is equal to p times p all the way down times p, and then I'm going to do a times 1 at the end, meaning that here we've got p minus 1 terms that are equal to p, and then we've got another term which is equal to 1, which means in the end we have p total terms. And now what I'll do is I'll do some replacements. I'll replace this second p with p minus 1, the next one with p minus 2, and so on and so forth. And that's going to give us something that's strictly bigger than p uh, times p minus 1 all the way down 3 times 2 times 1, which is equal to p factorial. But then p factorial is pretty clearly bigger than p minus 1 factorial plus 1. You can prove that. Maybe I'll leave that as a bit as a homework exercise. So we've got p minus one factorial plus one, but therein lies the problem. Notice over here on the left-hand side, we have p minus one factorial plus one is in fact strictly bigger than itself. But of course that's impossible. A number cannot be strictly bigger than itself, reaching a contradiction. So that contradicted this assumption up here that we had a solution in the case when p is bigger than or equal to seven, finishing our argument that those three are the only primes satisfying this condition. Okay, now let's move on to our second problem, which is to find the limit as a goes to one from below of one minus a times the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of a to the n power times e to the a to the n power. Okay. So I want to start here by maybe multiplying the numerator and the denominator by one minus a to the e. So that's going to give me the following. So I have the limit as a goes to one from below of one minus a over one minus a to the e. And then I'm actually going to split this into two limits, which you can do because as we'll see, both limits will exist. And so the second limit will be the limit as a goes to one from below of, let's see, one minus a to the e, and then our sum. So we've got the same sum, n equals zero up to infinity of a to the n to the e, and then e to the a to the n to the e. So something like that. But now let's observe that this first limit that I'm underlining in orange is fairly straightforward. We could perhaps use L'Hopital's rule if we wanted to, and we would see that we would get one over E. So this turns into one over E times that second limit. But I'm gonna use a trick for this second limit. I'm actually gonna do a substitution or a change of variables in this second limit where I set Q equal to A 
to the e. But notice, since a is smaller than 1, and it's approaching 1 from below, then q will also be smaller than 1 and approach 1 from below. So we have this same thing. This limit as q goes to 1 from below of, now it looks like 1 minus q times the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity of, let's see, it'll be q to the n and then e to the q to the n. So we've got something that looks like that. But now I'd like to observe that we can rewrite this in the following way. So I'm gonna copy a bunch of this stuff down. I have my one minus q term here, and then I've got this sum n going from zero to infinity, q to the n. And then here I'm gonna write f of q to the n. And this is where f of x is equal to e to the x. And now at this stage, I'm gonna use a result that we had in a previous video. I did this video about the so-called quantum integral, and it turns out that this thing that I'm underlining in brown is exactly the quantum interval of, the quantum integral of e to the x. So maybe I urge you to check that video out if you'd like. So here, this is equal to one over e, and now we have this limit as q goes to one from below of the quantum integral from zero to one of e to the x. And here we write dqx, just to say that it's maybe the q deformed integral of the quantum integral. But in that video about the quantum integral, we proved that if we allow the limit of the maybe q deformation to approach one, just like we're doing here, one from below that is, we get the so-called classical integral, the normal integral. So that means this is equal to one over e, and then the integral from zero to one of e to the x dx. But that integral is fairly straightforward. You can use the fundamental theorem of calculus and pretty quickly get to e minus one over e. But that means we've evaluated our limit, and that's a good place to stop.